the, the march and the protest is not meant to change the law. The march and the protest is to bring awareness to the problem. And once that awareness is unearthed, then it requires some action after that. You're listening to the Black and Blue Podcast, a discussion and celebration of the roles of African Americans and other minorities in U.S. law enforcement. Your host on the Black and Blue Podcast is Dale Peters, a law enforcement professional with over 20 years experience in the business. Hop on board this Black and Blue train of interviews, current events, and pop culture conversations. So get ready. The Black and Blue Podcast is coming at you right now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to the interrogation room. My name is Dale. I'm the host of the Black and Blue Podcast. Thank you for joining me here today. Uh, every week, the uh, the show is growing, and I appreciate it, and it's all because of you. And today, uh, a testament to that is we're going to have somebody real special here for you. He is the special agent in charge at the uh, Office of the Inspector General for the Department of Labor in the United States. He works out of the Atlanta region. Everybody, please help me welcome in. Rafiq Ahmad. Good afternoon. How you doing, sir? Pretty good. How about yourself, Dale? Excellent, excellent. Out here in California, how you doing out there in uh, in Georgia? Man, it's, uh, it's a nice, good, sunny day. You know, uh, and we are uh, doing the best we can here. How you dealing with the COVID nineteen situation out there? Man, I'm getting better with it. You know, uh, initially, you know, um, it's a little bit, you know, bumps in the road. Uh, I'm not used to working. From home, anybody that knows me know I'm a I'm a person that gets out in the uh, in the street as much as possible. So it's a little bit different, you know, being uh, being sheltered in place, you know. But uh, after you know uh, doing it for a few weeks, I was able to uh, get a comfortable routine and a comfortable place to work from and a nice good setup. So everything is good now. Right. Yeah, I mentioned that you know you're the special agent in charge, but how the agents out there? We'll, we'll we'll get into you know your department and and the, uh, what the agency does, but how are the agents actually handling their work now that they're, are they sheltered in place? What are they doing? Yeah, they, well, we, we pretty much went to a hundred uh, percent uh, telework. Um, and we've been doing that now since, uh, gosh, probably early March. Um, so initially there were people who, um, same thing, they wanted to get out, you know, and go, you know, uh, get in the field and do some things. But um, we made a decision as a, as an agency, to uh, until we kind of get a handle on things and actually not just get a handle on what's going on, but make sure that we have the equipment, proper equipment for people in, in, uh, in case they do have to go out. You know, you don't want people going to meetings and, um, you know, they don't have the proper protective equipment. You know, um, so, you know, initially we had some people, hey, they wanted to get out, they wanted to get out, but no, but they kind of settled in. No, and now we have people get out on a case by case basis, but making sure that they're protected when they go out. Got it, got it, got it. So, what is uh, the OIG, the Office of Inspector General for the Department of Labor? What, what do you guys do there? Um, now, we are one of the unique um, agencies in, in that our mission is um, very broad. A lot of um, IG offices um, do primarily internal investigations. Um, we do probably, gosh, I would say a small, small percentage of internal investigations and the rest of our stuff, you know, um, is actually going out in the field and doing investigations, um, centered around some of our programs. One of the big ones that comes from COVID-19, um, is unemployment, uh, insurance. You know, um, that was a, a big thing because when they passed the CARES Act, uh, part of that was making sure that people could, um, uh, get unemployment, um, so that they, you know, didn't end up running out of money. Well, anytime you, you have a, a massive, you know, um, effort like the CARES Act, then the first thing that's, that we're going to be looking for is, you know, um, how is that program being defrauded or is that program being defrauded in some kind of way? Um, and um, we had a problem with unemployment insurance, particularly before uh, the CARES Act, but after the CARES Act, it just exploded. You know, so um, so we've had um, a number of uh, new investigations involving people fi- filing false um, unemployment insurance claims. And that entails people filing claims in other people's names or people filing claims saying that they're, um, well, I was working and I was making this amount of money 
Yeah, they probably were, but that may have been a job that they had two years ago. So there's any number of fraudulent schemes that come as a result of um, specifically the CARES Act. And so that's how um, our work has shifted uh, you know, now. Um, but we have a myriad of other programs um, that we're involved in um, investigatively as well. Right, right. And for those that don't know our listeners and, and our viewers here, uh, we're talking about this is a federal agency. How long have you been there? Uh, I've been um, at the Department of Labor now for about almost five and a half years now. Okay. And by how many agents are there employed with the uh, with the uh, with the agency? With the agency in total, um, there's probably about 150 or so um, that are with the agency. So you guys are spread pretty thin. Is is a lot of work coming your way? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And what I tell people though know, is um, there's a difference between. Um, yeah, you say an IG, you know, uh, IG's office and um, what you would consider um, the traditional, you know, three letter agencies. Um, and because I came from one of those, then I, I could actually tell you what helped me as far as the mindset. So when you're with DEA or FBI, you know, um, or um, ATF, um, which is where I was before, those are all law enforcement agencies. That's their, their, fir- their primary function. The difference is when you come to an IG's office, you're basically coming to an agency with a law enforcement function as opposed to the opposite way around. You know, um, so um, what do I mean by that is that the IG's office is a small component of the Department of Labor uh, as a whole. But all IG's offices are the same way, you know, whether it's um, uh, Health and Human Services, you know, that's a big department, but it also has an IG's office. Mm. You know, um, Veterans Affairs, huge department, but it has an IG's office. So um, that is, that, that's important for people to understand that the IG's office doesn't necessarily drive the agency as much as it is an a, a comp- important component of the agency, as opposed to, like I said, DEA, you know, um, drug enforcement is going to drive that, you know, particular, so that's going to be their primary mission is that particular, you know, function and the things that come around that, you know, so it's just a little bit different um, thought process. So it's more, um, it's more of a focused mission, um, than a broad mission, um, like some of the other agencies. Right. Right. And, uh, like you said, you came from ATF and there's FBI, DEA, but there's also an IG's office in the the department of justice where all those agencies are housed there too. So yeah, there's IG's offices, you know, all over up and down the the federal ladder there. So yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, so what, brought you into law enforcement in the first place? I know, is, I know you said you were ATF. Is that where you started in law enforcement? Yes. I worked at ATF for about 27 and a half years and then uh, left in 2015 um, and took a promotion over to uh, the uh, Department of Labor's IG's office as the uh, special agent in charge. Um, now, what brought me to law enforcement? Um, I would say probably interesting, but not necessarily a unique story, because I, I would imagine that someone else in law enforcement probably has the same story. So when I was in, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and I can remember having several incidents, incidents where I you know, had negative um, interactions with, with law enforcement, and not because I was necessarily doing anything wrong, um, but that's kind of the way it was. If you were um, young and, you know, and, and African-American, you could you know, actually find yourself you know, in a police stop or something like that. There was one particular stop um, that I can remember on a, on a hot summer day, a buddy and I were, were driving. We, were, we went to drop a, a friend of ours off across town. And I can remember a police car following us all the way across town and drop him off. We dropped them off and then they followed us all the way back. The same car followed us all the way back. Um, my buddy was, uh, I want to say it was just maybe in his first year of college. He had uh, Virginia tags on his car. Um, and as we got a block away from where we were going, we found ourselves pulled over. Um, and I'm not sure if you're from the city, you know, one of the things that you know we you know do in the city or did in the city was people sit on their steps, you know, um, at night in the neighborhood, you know, right. just kind of sitting out talking to other people in the neighborhood. So the neighborhood was packed, you know, um, that night. So we ended up getting stopped by not only the one car that was following us, but four other cars showed up. Um, they got us out of the car, um, had our hands on the hood. They, they searched the entire vehicle. 
um, including the trunk um, of the car, um, you know, basically on a fishing expedition. You know, so it left me with a feeling that, you know, and we asked, we challenged the officer, asked him various questions um, to which, you know, which invoked a little bit of hostility from him. But he kind of just bullied us into allowing him to um, do what he was doing and, and, and search the vehicle. Of course, he didn't find anything. You know, we were both, you know, kids who, um, you know, were upstanding kids, never had any any run-ins with the uh, with the law. But it left me with a feeling that my rights had somehow or another been violated. You know, and then, you know, I thought, you know, hey, I would like to find out more about, you know, um, you know what happened and, 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 and how it happened. So when I ended up the next year going to, uh, to, uh, to college, I ended up saying, hey, I saw criminal justice courses, you know, um, in the syllabus. And I said, you know what, I'm going to uh, I'm going to pick up, you know, uh, well, I say on, on the syllabus, on the schedule, I'm going to get into one of these criminal justice courses just to find out, you know, if I can confirm my suspicion. So the more courses that now I took, you know, the more courses I wanted to take and learn more about um, about it. And I still didn't want to go into law enforcement. Yet. I still was kind of like standoffish, like, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with these guys, you know. Um, but then the more I was around, the more I learned. Um, you and I had a discussion earlier about the, you know, it's not a zero sum game. So we're not looking at it as, well, if I don't get everything I want, then I can't be involved in you know, such and such. So I figured that in order for me to learn more, in order for me to change this particular culture, at least from one man's perspective, I had to get in the game. And so that's when I started, um, you know, looking for opportunities to actually get into um, law enforcement. And I just kind of, the same friend who was driving me for you know, that particular day, he ended up getting a, a job with ATF, really just working his way through school. Um, and so he told me, hey man, they so they, they're hiring over here. So um, I had to pay some bills. So I went ahead and, uh, and applied for a job. And I actually ended up you know, coming to, to the job and worked my way through college. And then that's how I actually ended up pursuing the profession. When you when you went there, did you work as an, uh, as an agent as your first job or was no, it a civilian? No, when, I, when, I, when I first worked there, I was just a, uh, a civilian, you know, just a, a guy trying to pay his rent. You know, um, but I tell uh, I tell everybody as far as the young guys, you know, um, it doesn't matter what job you have if, you know, and I, and I use fast food and things like that as an example. If you're working at McDonald's or they have you sweeping the floor, you know, you want to make sure that you do the best job possible, you know, um, sweeping that floor because you never know what opportunity that's going to lead to. So when I first came to the agency, you know, uh, I came in as a clerk, you know, um, but for me, it was paying my bills and it was getting me away from the job that I had before I came there which I was working on a trash truck, you know, oh, yeah. so yeah. I'm in air conditioning now versus working on a trash <laughs> truck, you know, uh-huh. clean environment. Hey, I'm going to make sure I get my, my hustle on. I do what I can. And so the more I did, the more responsibility I got. Um, and then when they were having other people that they were letting, you know, go seasonally, they kept me around, you know, and then the next year they kept me around, kept me around. And then finally, after I graduated, I was able to, you know, walk right into, a job as opposed to some of those other people who were pounding the pavement looking for a job. Right, right. That's good stuff, man. Good stuff. And then uh, were you still in Baltimore or where, where were you at at that time? No, I actually left um, uh, Baltimore. Man, I had kind of an accelerated uh, uh, childhood. I was uh, actually went to a, a magnet school in uh, in Baltimore. But earlier, you know, um, as, a, as a kid, I had uh, uh, skipped a grade um, or so. So, when I actually finished school, I was 16. Um, nice. That next year, um, I was uh, out of school and I, I went to a, um, a smaller college before I ended up uh, enrolling, going to the University of Maryland. Um, so in order for me to go to the University of Maryland, it was easier for me to move closer to the campus. So probably about... Mm, a little bit after I was 17, I actually moved out, you know, um, and went to live closer to, uh, closer to campus in, uh, in an apartment with, uh, with my same childhood friend. Um, he and I went to school together and, and uh, actually had uh, shared an apartment together, um, you know, there. So that's kind of, you know, where the, where that part of the journey, uh, began. Okay. And when you worked in the ATF, were you, where, what, I'm sure you're all over because that's what they do with feds. But uh, mm-hmm. where did you last your last assignment? Where was that? My last assignment, um, 
I was a uh, I was one of the uh, field supervisors over arson and explosives. So that's where I ended my uh, my ATF career. Prior mm-hmm. to that, I spent some time in the um, as a uh, supervisor of the intelligence uh, division. And then prior to that, I was over violent crime. You know, um, so I'm one of the people in ATF who can probably say I have a rare story in that I've worked in almost every um, uh, major division that they have. So they had administrative, uh, they had uh, regulatory, and then uh, the enforcement side. And I worked in all three of those. Um, and I truly started in the basement of the, uh, the agency, you know, and ended up, um, you know, leaving, you know, from uh, field supervision and then going on taking a taking a position elsewhere. So, um, so I, yeah, I definitely had to pay, uh, you know, pay my dues as far mm-hmm. as in that, in that, you know, 27 plus year period, you know, uh, I, I did probably all I could do there and probably did some stuff twice. So yeah. it was kind of a thing where I, I had, uh, run my course, you know, there as far as, um, things that I, that I probably would have been interested in doing, you know, there. So going to the uh, IG's office was something new, you know, and it just presented a different challenge for me. Right. And were you in Georgia when you, when you, your last assignment in, in ATF, were you in Georgia then? Yes. Okay. I started off in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and then my first field assignment was in Greensboro, North Carolina. I stayed there for about a little over seven years. Then I went to a small place, Macon, Georgia. Um, which is about an hour south of uh, Atlanta, where I stayed for about nine years. And then I went to Atlanta proper um, and spent the rest of my time with ATF in Atlanta. And then I was lucky enough to be able to transition from uh, ATF to um, the IG's office right there in Atlanta. Right. So you, so you didn't have to move far. You already there in Atlanta. Okay. That's right. You just had to yeah. move downtown. Yeah. So what, what, what are your functions as, as the uh, special agent in charge? What, what, what do you do in that position? Now, the, I tell people this in, in leadership because people can come up with all these fancy things. Well, I do this, I do that. At its core, you know, I tell people my job is very simple, very easy. I only have to do two things. You know, my job is to provide resources and remove obstacles. You know, so those are the two simplest things. I try to keep it as simple as that. So I'm responsible for overseeing, you know, the investigative activities of the Southeast region. You know, so... The people who actually really do the work are the people who are boots on the ground, you know, that work for me. You know, I pretty much just make sure that, uh, you know, we're going in the right direction. We have the right personnel and the right, you know, tools that we need to get that done, you know, and, um, you know, communicate the vision, you know, to the people that work for me. You know, so like I said, I can make it seem like, oh, I'm the guy that does it. The the people who actually are out there doing it, those are the ones who, you know, are the, the real important ones, the ones that get the job done. No doubt. No doubt. And uh, so you're pretty entrenched in the uh, in the Georgia area in the landscape there. You you got uh, family in down there in Georgia with you now? Um, some now. My uh, I come from a large family, and uh, all of my family pretty much is in, still in the Maryland area. Uh, a couple of my family members have migrated here, you know, but pretty much everybody else lives uh, lives up north. You you get back there every now and then to see them, or I used to now down, down longer you in the south. You know, uh, your blood changes. You know, right. so now once I go back uh, up north, I get cold a little bit quicker yep. than I used to. So, uh, so yeah, I go back for a visit, um, but um, not as not as often, you know, as I used to. And to be honest, I went more frequently until I actually had um, a family here. Then it made it a little bit tougher to just pick up, you know, and go to uh, to Maryland for a quick visit because now you got to coordinate everybody else's schedule and try to take everybody else with you. Right. No, um, but um, but yeah, I, I still get back there um, as often as I can. All right. So I noticed that uh, the shirt that you're wearing there says Noble. And for the people that don't know what Noble is, can can you tell us that? Absolutely. Noble is the uh, national organization of Black law enforcement executives, um, and we are a uh, uh, organization that has chapters all over the country um, and um, uh, in the Caribbean as well. Okay. And what, what do you do with Noble? Uh, my current position with Noble, uh, I am the uh, president of the uh, Georgia chapter um, of Noble. Okay. And, and what's the, like, the function of Noble? Um, the, Noble seeks to, uh, at its core, um, make sure it is uh, what we call uh, equitable administration of, you know, uh, you know, of justice, whether that's, you know, um, you know, locally, you know, um, as far as a, a case like the 
Ahmaud Arbery uh, case in uh, Brunswick, Georgia, you know, or if that's you know uh, something where you know um, you know a person is having a particular problem, you know, with their with their agency where there's discrimination, you know, um, going on, you know, um, you know, systemically, you know, um, you know, nobles one of nobles' models is justice by action, you know, so you know, you know, we're we're about you know, um, establishing and extending a network, you know, um, of people, you know, ac across the country, you know, um, so that we can, you know, ensure, like I said, that there's a, you know, equitable, you know, administration of justice, you know, um, you know, ac across the country. Right. So does that mean there's, uh, you know, one of its missions is trying to promote, uh, African Americans and in, in positions of power within law enforcement agencies? Absolutely. I mean, it's one of the ways that, um, Noble was started, you know, um, actually as a as, as what we call a CEO symposium. So, you know, there was a, a meeting, you know, um, you know, um, in Washington where all of these different people, you know, from around the country came together. These, uh, you know, executives to discuss, you know, um, some similar issues that they were, you know, seeing, you know, issues in, uh, you know, uh, in the community, issues, you know, um, as uh, as it relate to promotional opportunities and um, treatment of people on, you know, on the job, you know, um, and making sure that people had the uh, opportunities to, to be able to be promoted equally, you know, with their counterparts. You know, so one of the things that we do as an organization, we help people to get ready, you know, for these positions because we can't very well say, Hey, well, I want Dale to be, you know, um, the chief of police, but then we know that Dale's not ready to be the chief of police. So we provide a platform of training and mentorship you know, as an organization so that when we say, hey, we, we think that, you know, you should um, look at, you know, African-American applicants for police chief. And we think that Dale Peters is, is a good, you know, uh, you know, uh, choice for that. When you come in to interview, you know, uh, Noble has a, a support system to make sure you're prepared for that particular job. And if you're, you know, fortunate enough to get that job, then Noble has a support system to make sure you're capable of, you know, knowing you know, that you have the, the right people that you can call and talk to to mentor you through that job. You know, and I want to say that right now we have, I, I believe, about six police, well, six police chiefs in, female police chiefs, probably in the state of North Carolina. I know there's quite a few, but several of them are noble members, you know, um, and several of them have been members of the Georgia chapter. You know, so, uh, so, just, just things like that, making sure that we can effectively change the culture, you know, not by just saying, hey, we think you should hire a black person, but we want to give you a, a buffet of qualified black people that you can select from. Right, right. And that's one of the things that the organization does. Now, there's a slight misnomer. People think that because it's the national organization of black law enforcement executives, that we only have black members. You no, know, but that's not true. We have you know, we have several, you know, um, you know uh, white members of, you know, um, of Noble because they believe in the work. They believe in the, all the tenets of what I just told you and the concepts of what I just told you. They believe in all of those things, too. And they think it's important, you know, um, to provide those same mentorship opportunities, training opportunities. And they felt strong enough about, you know, that belief that they actually joined the organization themselves. So, um, so that, that's a testament to their character. Know, as well as the the quality and character of the people in the organization. Definitely, definitely. So as far as, you know, helping uh, other African-Americans and, and other minorities, I'm sure as well, is there like trainings involved? Uh, you know, how are these, yeah. how is this actually getting out to the people? Well, Noble has two structured trainings throughout the year. One is the, um, the winter symposium. Um, that's the, what we call the uh, CEO symposium. That's a uh, kind of a smaller gathering. Um, this year, it was it was uh, slated to be held in Atlanta, in, uh, in Atlanta, but COVID nineteen um, actually caused that to be postponed until November. Um, and then there's the uh, the national training conference, um, which this year um, was scheduled to be in Cleveland um, in July, um, but that has been since postponed because of uh, because of COVID nineteen. But both of those are excellent training opportunities, you know, for um, you know, people in federal, state, local law enforcement um, to be able to do the same thing we were just talking about. You know, you want to be, you know, uh, a police chief one day or you want to, you know, um, 
you know, you want to be a sergeant with your police force. You know, these are opportunities where you can come, you know, um, and do two things. One, you can talk one on one to people who are already in those positions or people who have long since retired, you know, from one of those positions, but they can mentor you. And you actually have training in different, you know, um, ongoing trends, you know, um, and things that are, you know, um, that will later be important to you as far as how to handle, you know, different situations, you know, um, and, you know, uh, different ways to, to, to kind of learn what you should do in a particular situation. I know how you should handle uh, your department or how you should, you know, um, approach things from a supervisory perspective to move you through those, you know, those situations a little bit smoother. You know, so, um, so Noble provides that platform, you know, for people who are actively in law enforcement. And you don't, you know, uh, you don't have to be just in law enforcement to be a part of Noble. You can be an associate member, you know, um, you know somebody who's not sworn, but you still want to be involved you know, um, in the organization. So there's different ways for you to be involved. So those are the platforms that we have for the people who are actually members of Noble. You know, but we also do things in the community. You know, um, um, a few years back, we started uh, delivering a platform called the Law in Your Community. You know, um, and this is something where um, noble chapters around the country uh, go out to the community and um, present something called the Law in Your Community, where we try to teach young folks, you know, um, about, you know, um, you know uh, their rights, you know, um, about you know, uh, police practices and why police do some of the things that they do to help foster an understanding, you know, um, of law enforcement, you know, from, from our perspective, but to also interact with them and gain their perspective of us, you know, as to um, why they think we do certain things or what their perception of what we do um, is, you know, and that only helps um, both of us in making sure that, you know, we're continuing to dispel these myths and build these relationships and build this trust. You know, so we've been doing that as a, uh, as an organization uh, for a little while now. All right. So, uh, you know, all this mentorship, I know you've seen some sort of uh, pay, pay out on that. You've seen uh, other African-Americans ascend to prominent positions, you know, as chiefs of police and, and uh, county sheriffs and stuff like that. But what about on the federal side? I know you're, you're in a small agency now. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, what sort of opportunities have you seen in your own agency uh, for African-Americans? Um, some. Now, my, my agency is, is small. So right now I am the only uh, black uh, SAC that we have in the, in the agency. Um, there was, um, well, I'm sorry, there were two others. Um, but they both um, they both retired. Um, one um, was one is the former uh, president of the D.C. chapter of Noble. He's now the U.S. Marshal um, in uh, in D.C. And there was a uh, another um, female SAC who retired. Um, she chose to take a job um, on upon her retirement outside of law enforcement altogether. But it was in her study discipline. Um, so right now I'm the lone uh, the lone soldier in my agency as far as um, you know, in this particular position. Right. Um, but the prior, the prior agency as well? Was, was there a lot of growth there? Prior agency, there was some, you know, um, but there was always um, room for improvement. Okay. Um, so we didn't have a, a lot of people in executive positions, you know, in my, in my former agency, you know, um, but there were sprinkles of them. Um, not that there weren't people that were qualified, but again, you know, um, you know, there's sometimes still that glass ceiling, you know, that, um, you know, that we run into um, in law enforcement on the federal side and probably on the state and local side as well. Right. Let me let me ask you, um, did you find a lot of African-Americans even applying for, you know, ATF jobs? And, and I would assume not so much uh, IG jobs with labor uh, only because maybe I don't know the stigma or it's not as well known. You know, you mm -hmm. would probably see more applying for you know maybe DEA Mm -hmm. my more apply for you know the marshals more apply for FBI could you see something like that as being a, a an obstacle yeah you know and um one of the things i did for the last 3 years or so before i left atf was um in conjunction with noble uh and um um atf uh, hr department you know um i was one of the people in my area you know who um heavily recruited, you know, um, African-Americans. Now, 
what is a little known fact, um, and if, if you're in federal service, it's not a little known fact to you. It's probably widely held um, uh, knowledge that not only are there underrepresentations of African American males, African American females are even more rare, oh, yeah. you know, in the federal uh, system. So um, we specifically recruited um, both male and female, um, you know, agents. But uh, I know in my current agency, there's not a lot of um, of, of uh, black females, um, but that's kind of true across the board, you know, right. um, as far as um, as far as our profession. You know, um, I'm not, and I'm not sure um, how easy of a fix that is, but but that's definitely a problem. Um, so yes, I noticed that in in ATF, uh, and we did have several directors when I was there, you know, who who tried to pay specific attention to that. But a person, um, if you haven't interviewed him, he he's probably a person that you you want to know. His name is Matt Horace. You know, uh, Matt Horace, um, he retired from ATF. Um, and he's now, uh, um, working for, uh, the Mayo Clinic. Um, he's, he's a good friend and, and, and a mentor. Um, and he actually wrote a book called the, the, the Black and the Blue, um, which is a great book. Um, of course, great name well, too. That's right. <laughs> but, but he says something that, um, he, he says it in the book, but he said this to me in conversations with him. He says that, uh, the culture eats strategy for lunch. You know, um, so what does he mean by that? You know, so you can come into an agency. Um, before I left um, ATF, there was a, we had an African-American director at one point in time. Um, I thought he was one of the better directors that I, that I experienced um, working with. There was another gentleman who was there um, before him that was very good as well. Um, uh, his name was uh, Michael Sullivan. Um, but the last guy who was the African-American I, uh, African American guy. His name is Todd Jones. Todd Jones is a former Marine. He works for the NFL now, I believe. Um, but he had an excellent, you know, strategy. You feel like you come from the military. You, you know, he was a U.S. attorney. You know, he was a very um, introspective and strategic guy. You know, but if you're coming into a culture as an outsider, you know that, and that culture is strong, it's hard for you to break through that, even with the best strategy. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that's what he means when he says that you know, uh, culture, eat strategy for lunch, you know, is that the best intentions, you know, sometimes don't get very far if you don't necessarily understand the depths of the culture that you're, that you're stepping into. And the law enforcement culture, you know, as a whole is not necessarily a, a, a an inherently racist culture. You no. Know, um, so don't, you know, um, don't think that I'm saying that, but it is, it is, it is a culture that, that's not, necessarily heavily, you know, vested with African-Americans. You know, uh, it's also um, a traditionally misogynistic culture. You know, so it's not a culture, you know, that says, okay, you know, I'm going to uh, chose choose to be led by, you know, this brilliant woman, you know, uh, because it's just yep. counterintuitive to, yep. you know, the Neanderthal, you know, way that we think sometimes. You know, um, so those are all things that, you know, it's taking a long time to kind of turn, you know, um, to turn around because there are deep seated, um, deep seated cultures, you know, but hopefully, you know, um, they will gradually, you know, um, continue to change for the better, especially with organizations like Noble, you know, um, and people like the, the people that we have that are non African Americans, you know, that have had the courage to actually join, you know, Noble and help you know, us push this mission forward, we'll get to where we need to be. Right, right. So, uh, you know, on that note, uh, earlier you mentioned the uh, the Arbery case down there in Georgia. How, how's that affected uh, the community down there and, uh, and law enforcement down there as well? Well, just as one would imagine, you know, um, it, it causes fracture, you know, because the, the sad, one of the saddest things about the Arbery case is it's one of many similar cases throughout the country that are all seemingly simultaneously going on, you know, um, and I, I don't know, I don't have an answer for if there's something in the water, why do we keep having these particular instances where we have, we, we thought this one was the most egregious and then you see something else and you say, wow, that's even worse than the last, you know, um, case that we had. What, you know, what's, 
what's going on? How do these things continue to uh, to happen? And of course, what people should should realize though, in the Arbery case, it's different than some of the other cases that we've seen. And here's how: the Arbery case is more uh, synonymous or similar to um, the George Zimmerman case because yep. both of those involve non-law enforcement yep, civilians, people yep. acting in a vigilante you know um, way. No, but because of these individuals' backgrounds, especially in the Arbery case, because one of those guys formerly worked for the DA's office, you know, and the actions after that one could kind of lump it into the same unarmed, you know, um, shooting of a of an individual by law enforcement. But these people in this particular case, you know, were not law enforcement. So we need to make make sure people understand you know, that distinction. That was just a situation now, now where does the law enforcement piece come in well because this information was known in february about what actually transpired in that particular incident yep. and in this case we're not talking about law enforcement actions as much as law enforcement inaction right you know that actually caused the the, the public you know to you know to be um outraged by what was going on you no know, um but here's what i want people to understand that the the Aubrey family has a you know has very adequate legal um, representation. Um, they have Mr. Merritt, you know um, Lee Merritt is one of their attorneys, and um, a friend of mine, Mr. Ben Crump. They have adequate you know um, legal representation. That case has been moved to another um, prosecutor, and that case is moving forward. So. What what has to be done or what can be done beyond that? Well, what, what was I just saying before about the culture? You no, know, there has to be a shift, you know, in you know, the cultural norm. You know, um, and what do I mean by that? Well, in this case, just like in the Zimmerman case, because people kind of misrepresent it as the, the Trayvon Martin case. But Trayvon Martin wasn't the offender. It was George Zimmerman. You know, and George Zimmerman was the defendant. No, so in the Zimmerman case and in the Arbery case, you had uh, situations where an individual approached a you know, young African American person with the understanding in their mind that they could compel this person into obedience with no authority to do so. Exactly. In their mind, they had authority, and God knows what that authority was, but I can speculate as to what they believed their authority was, but it wasn't a legal authority, but they proceeded as if they had some legal authority to compel this person to obedience, a person walking down a public street um, and you confront the person and ask the person for you know, anything, identification, or you start questioning the person, interrogating the person, you have the authority to do that. No. But they took it to the extreme in both instances where once the person didn't comply, they tried to compel the person to comply with physical force. You know, so this is taken to a different level because you're saying, in my mind, I have the authority to accost you and then I can make a well, citizen's arrest, you know, and, and say you can know what I'm not sure. I'm not sure who else would actually think that that was it was okay to say i'm just going to go and confront yeah. a person and then i'm going to pull out a weapon and confront that person and then i can't speak for many other people but i grew up in the hood if right. somebody jumps out you know with a gun well first of all you only have to jump out if i see the the, the car is slowing down it's coming you, you out in la yep you, you, if the car yep. slows down and I me mean, that that's you know that's usually not good yeah mm -hmm. you either gonna you know you know you either gonna flee or you're going to fight in this particular right. instance, you can see by the video that somebody jumps out of a vehicle with a weapon. You know, you only have two choices you know, in that particular instance. You know, so, um, so yeah, these are things that, that, that are disturbing, um, but it shouldn't be confused. So now, why did I, you know, start off with the part that I started off with as far as understanding the, the, the internal culture? Well, because part of what you can do as a citizen and part of what you have to do, what you are compelled to do as a citizen, is you have to exercise your rights as a citizen. If you don't like the way that the district attorney handled that you know, particular case, or you don't like the way that 
you know, a sheriff's department handles something or the mayor handles this. What are those what are those titles have in common? They're all elected officials for the most part. So you have to participate in the political process right. to the point where you have to have voter education, uh, voter registration, and voter participation. You have to do all three of those things in order to be able to have a voice in your community. And that's your primary voice is your vote. Right. You know, so you have to get up and register. Well, and if you're one of those people who do, doesn't have a voter registration card because of prior felony or something like that, you might have a vehicle registration card, which means what? If you can't go vote, you can drive people to the polls and make sure that they do vote. But you yeah. have to participate in the process. Yeah. Well, you know, in this case in particular, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know the, the area out there. But uh, if people were were displeased with how that was handled and we're talking about voting them out of office. Uh, what are the demographics of that area? Are the people in that area really displeased? It seems like this only moved forward when people outside of that community uh, uh, got wind of it and, and made a stink about it. So, uh, yes. And that's, and that's the whole um, aspect of, of where social media comes in, you know, um, because social media um, and the way it is, it, it allowed this particular vehicle, video to go viral, you know, um, as they say, and then brought outside pressure. Now, the outside pressure can come to that community and say, hey, look at this, look at this. But what the outside pressure can't do, we can't vote in their local election. Exactly. So they have to be able to, you know, um, um, get, you know, this galvanization and this pressure and this spotlight, just like people um, don't understand the distinction between a march or a protest and what happens after that? Well, the, the march and the protest is not meant to change the law. The march and the protest is to bring awareness to the problem. And once that awareness is unearthed, then it requires some action after that. You know, so people get hyped up about the march. And then once the march is over, then they think, oh, we really did something. No, you started something. Now you have to finish it by actually, you know, performing a function, a, a another proactive function, which is you have to go galvanize, you know, and then go out and finish the, the protest by voting, you know, so um, or participating you know, in the in the in the process. You know, so I think that's kind of um, what we have to make people aware that you do have a bigger voice than um, than you think uh, and you have to use it. No doubt. No doubt. Exactly. Been preaching that all along. So, yes. Yeah. So uh, who are your professional role models uh, as, 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 it, as it talks to, uh, to law enforcement, uh, people that you looked up to, people that you mm-hmm. kind of got you started and uh, in the right direction? Man, there's so many um, that I would be you know, remiss in just mentioning a few, but there's people who you know uh, were mentors at the early stage of my career. There's another a gentleman who um, you know is prominent you know, in a noble organization, uh, Mark Logan, you know, who was one of the first people that I met that was an executive, a black executive, um, when, when I was at ATF as a very young guy. And uh, he kept on recruiting me and recruiting me. But at that time, I didn't want to have anything to do with law enforcement because I was still licking my wounds from this other incident or, you know, incidents that I had had before. But he kept saying, well, man, you, you, your major is criminal justice. You ever thought about, you know, doing this? And, ah, I don't want anything to do with that. But eventually, you know, I, I came, uh, you know, I, I came along, you know, and actually uh, took his advice. Then, so Mark was a was an early, you know, um, influence. But remember what I was saying, too, that, you know, um, not all the time is your, you know, um, assistance or your mentoring going to come from somebody who looks like you. You have to be willing to accept it. You know, when it comes from somebody who who doesn't. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. So there was a um, there was another guy who I worked for. His name was Don Keith. You know, uh, Don Keith was a uh, is a white guy. You know, um, but you know he saw potential in me. So when I first started applying for the job, even though I was working for the agency, I wasn't getting set up for an interview. So at the time, you know, you know ATF, you know, would always say, well, "We're not following. We're not finding qualified applicants." Well, he happened to be a part of a of a meeting group, him and another um, 
really good friend, a uh, gentleman by the name of Marvin Richardson, who's, who's an African-American. He's, he's now an executive um, with ATF and the deputy director. Um, but at the time he was working, you know, in this recruitment area, you know, so he had heard my name, but Don Keith knew me, knew me uh, personally. And they mentioned my name in, in these meetings and, and I was able to actually get an interview, for, you know, for the job. And that kind of pushed me, you know, um, into my, uh, into my actual law enforcement career. Now, the interesting thing was I had only talked to Marvin Richardson on the phone. I'd never met him. You know, someone told me, you know, to give him a call and I did. Uh, and he helped me out, mentored me through the process. And we, we didn't meet until I actually got to the academy. Never seen him before. Um, but uh, when I saw him, I just one of those things where I felt like, hey, this is somebody I think I might know. And so I asked him, hey, are you Marvin? And he said, yes. So we actually met on the basketball court, you know, um, after having talked on the phone and him having helped me, you know, through my career. But Don Keith was, like I said, one of the guys who helped me early. Um, there's a, another guy who, because a lot of my mentors later on, when I actually got into management, weren't even with the agency that I was with. So they weren't even with ATF. Um, former um, police chief here in Atlanta, George, Tur- uh, George Turner, you know, was a huge, um, you know, uh, influence, you know, for me because I was able to basically sit, you know, um, in meetings that he held as a police chief and just soak up different things that I wasn't getting from, um, from my agency. And I did that for about, gosh, uh, while he was there about five years or so, uh, maybe, maybe about six years, I was able to kind of get this almost like a free class you know, every week. You know, uh, another huge influence is a gentleman by the name of uh, Ray Moore, retired Secret Service, you know, um, uh, SAC, you know, who, um, you know, is a continuing mentor, um, retired um, major from uh, Atlanta Police Department, uh, Stan Savage, you know, um, and then when I first became a manager, one of the guys who helped me out the most um, was a was an APD sergeant, you no know, Atlanta Police Department sergeant named uh, Tim Brown, you know, um, you know, white guy, but you would think that he grew up in the heart of, uh, you know, uh, Compton or something as far as how he was, uh, okay. you know, just had, um, you know, uh, you know, an affinity for helping, you know, just helping other people out and just being good folks. You know, so he so he was a he was a really good guy. And then when I took uh, last but not least, when I took this particular job, the guy who helped me out the most and lowered my uh, learning curve um, is the guy who actually works directly for me. Um, you know, also a white guy, a guy by the name of Brian McGlamory. You know, um, you now he applied for the same job and didn't get it. So the reason why I always tell people, you know, um, that he's the epitome of a professional. Because he could have said, man, I'm going to take my ball, you know, and, and, and just walk away. You hired this guy over me, let him learn on his own. You know, um, but he didn't do that. He made sure that uh, everything I needed to know, you know, um, I was able to, you know, to get, you know, um, because he saw our success as a joint success. You know, um, so, so yeah, the, the influences are uh, myriad. Um, there's another um, two huge influences um, one is a lady by the name of Carolyn Williams, you know, who is um, works for the uh, Federal Reserve in, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. She worked with ATF when I was there. Um, I told you about Matt Horace. And then another very influential uh, woman is um, uh, Vanessa McLemore, who was uh, the first African-American female um, SAC you know, with ATF. You know, so uh, so, man, and I know I'm missing, you know, a bunch of people, yeah, but yeah. the people right off the top of my head that I can think were extremely influential. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, what are the more challenging parts of your job nowadays? Um, you know what? You know, remember I told you my job is very is very simple, and, it, and it's much more simplified in in management. So the most challenging thing that I can think of now is that in management you're no longer the doer. If that makes sense, so you can't necessarily always hands-on influence the outcome because you're the one that's responsible for it, for getting it done. You know, but you're not the person that's necessarily going to say, hey, I'll just go ahead and do this myself, or you'd be chasing your, you know, chasing your tail all day long. So it really requires that you develop, you know, um, you know trust, you know, um, in your, in your people that work, that work with you, you know, um, 
because you have to be able to trust that, you know, um, once you give a direction or a vision, it's going to be carried out by capable people and not try to micromanage them. You know, so um, so that was a challenge, you know, early when I realized that early that, hey, this isn't about me doing your job. Otherwise, one of us has the wrong job. You know, so it's about making sure that you're hired for a job. I'm hired for a job. Then I'm going to make sure that I give you, you know, the ability, the trust and the responsibility to do um, your job and then support you as opposed to me trying to micromanage you and do your job for you. All right. All right. So uh, on a personal note, I know you mentioned earlier that you met one of your mentors on a basketball court, and then off camera we talked a lot about uh, the NBA. Did you did you play ball back in the day? Or I played. Uh, it's funny. I played ball, and I was lucky enough to play with a lot of people who actually. Uh, in fact, I was watching the Last Dance the other day, and uh, I saw um, uh, Indiana. They were talking about Chicago Bulls in Indiana, and I remember uh, uh, playing against Travis Best. You know, um, yeah, I'm in, you know, um, in, in a in a pickup game. Um, but I played um, with uh, I, I went to, went to University of Maryland. The, I came the year um, that Lynn Bias, uh, you know, died. Now, oh, yeah. old school, you know, guys know who who Lynn Bias is. But uh, he was drafted by Boston, and then uh, yeah, tragedy. Yeah, he, yeah. he was uh, he was LeBron way before LeBron. You know, uh, he was the closest thing. You know, I'll say to that as far as uh, his his. Uh, his body composition, style, you know, um, his power, speed. He had all of those things um, back then in the, in the, in the eighties. But at, if you went to school at Maryland, you know, if you could play ball pretty decently, um, you would, you would uh, ultimately end up playing with any number of the, of the, uh, the, the, the Maryland basketball team during the summertime, almost all the ACC guys would come through uh, Maryland. So, um, so guys that, we you know later see on TV with guys that we played with, you know, um, right there on campus, you know, because they would come through all the time. So, um, so no, I never went and, uh, and, and played beyond, you know, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, kind of playing, um, you know, in, in different arenas, you know, as far as around town. Um, but uh, play with a uh, fortunate enough to play play with a number um, of players that actually did go to the league. Okay. All right. And then as we wrap this up, uh, where do you see yourself in the next five years? What's the future hold for you? Well, um, I'm one of those people who last year, you know, um, made it to a you know, uh, very important milestone, though, which is um, I can retire. You know, um, so um, so I'm uh, looking for what that next challenge is going to be. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty much ready to transition um, you know, out. I've been in federal service now a little over 31 years, you know, so I'm ready to, you know, um, to start moving, you know, and, and letting some of these, uh, these, uh, younger guys, you know, come in and, uh, spread their wings and then I can kind of step to the side and, 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 and get out. So, so I would like to see myself, you know, um, pursuing, you know, one of my, uh, you know, any number, hopefully other opportunities where I can, um, you know, retire from here and then, work someplace else. Um, I've been an entrepreneur though, probably since I was 13 years old, you know, so, um, so I have other, you know, business avenues, um, currently, you know, um, no, uh, and, and, but, but I also don't want to not do anything. I want to, you know, uh, I I would like to try to work at least in a corporate environment for a little bit and just kind of try that out because the majority, like say almost all my, you know, um, you know, career has been in government service. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I wish you lots of luck. You, you know, you say that uh, you've got over 30 years of experience, man. I, I don't believe it. You don't look like it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I wish you lots of luck on that. So, but uh, before I let you go, you know, uh, I don't know if you've seen the show, but I like to do a little something uh, with my guests at the end of the show. So let me set this up for you. All right, so this game I like to play with my guests is called... Uh, black or blue, 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 black or blue. Come on. All right, so this game is called Black or Blue, and all you got to do is... Uh, I'll I give you a category here. Your category today is Hollywood Shuffle. Hollywood okay. Shuffle, that's movie titles. Gotcha. I'm going to describe a movie for you, and you tell me, does that uh, movie have the, the word black in the title, or does it have the word blue in the title? Okay. Real simple. It's kind of testing your uh, your uh, pop culture knowledge here, your movies. I don't know if you're sitting around watching movies a lot, but I know a lot of us are now, so uh, let's see if you can get this. All right, here we go. All right. 
Your first one. This movie starring Chris Hemsworth. Uh, this movie is about a furloughed convict and his American and Chinese partners as they hunt a high-level cybercrime network from Chicago to Los Angeles to Hong Kong to Jakarta. Oh, Just man. black or blue. That's all you got to say. I'm going to say black. Oh, see, you would be, you'd be correct. That would be Black Hat. I don't know if you ever saw that one. Can't say I have, but I got Netflix. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, pull that up. Pull that up. Your next one. 160 elite U.S. soldiers drop into Somalia to capture two lieutenants of a renegade warlord, warlord and find themselves in a desperate battle with a large force of heavily armed Somalis. That would be Black Hawk Down. Definitely Black Hawk Down. All right. Two for two. All right. This next movie starring Steve Martin and Rick Moranis. This movie is about an uptight FBI agent who must protect a larger-than-life mobster with a heart of gold currently under witness protection in the suburbs. I'll say blue. Uh, you, and you guessed right. My Blue Heaven. You remember that movie? No, I don't. But Steve Martin and Rick Moranis you know, uh, were, were folks I grew up on. So uh, I've seen several of their movies. Yeah, 1990. Right there, you see the date on that one. A few more here for you. Uh, next one, a young boy and a bunch of misfit friends embark on a quest to find a dark magic item of ultimate power before a diabolical tyrant can. Um, I'm going to say blue. Uh, and you would you would be wrong on that. That was The Black Cauldron, a Disney oh, movie from 1985. That. Yeah, that's back in the way back in the day there. Yeah, uh, this, this next one here. Uh, this movie stars Elvis Presley as an army vet who returns home in Hawaii. He defies his parents' wishes for him to work at the family business and instead goes to work as a tour guide at his girlfriend's agency. That's gotta be blue. Definitely blue. That's blue Hawaii, 1961. Uh, next movie, Susan Price has written a number one bestseller, a steamy novel about a woman's search for the ultimate sexual uh, experience entitled The Dark Side of Judith. When Susan is framed for murder of her fiance, billionaire publisher Jack Reynolds, she eludes authorities by changing her identity and becoming the woman she wrote about in her book. Black Widow, is that it? Uh, that would be wrong. Oh, Two Shades of Blue. I've never seen that movie, but it uh, looks I like haven't. it's got Gary Busey in it and Eric Roberts. I like Eric Roberts. I remember him from uh, back in the day. Uh, a couple more for you. Uh, starring Jessica Lange. This uh, period piece drama is about a family moving into the into a military base and becomes part of a cover-up involving nuclear bomb tests. Hmm. I'll say black. Uh, you were off to such a good start. Uh, blue, oh, man, sky. <laughs> blue Sky. Blue Sky, 1994. And uh, here we go. Next one here. Um, the fate of horse. The fates of horses and the people who own and command them are revealed as this horse narrates the, psych the circle of his life. Man, you got me there, but I'll guess black. Uh, see, you guessed right. Black Beauty. Black okay. Beauty. Yeah. And your last one here. This movie starring Donnie Jepp. Uh, Johnny Jepp. Johnny Depp. This movie is based on the true story of Whitey Bulger, the brother of a state senator and the most infamous crime criminal in the history of South Boston. Yeah, and I can see that movie in my head. Um, gosh, I'll say blue. Oh, you were so close. Black Mass. Gosh, Black gosh, Mass. Gosh. <laughs> you know what? But I think you got more right than you got wrong. So let's, uh, I hope so. let's say you're a winner. I hope you nobody counted. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll edit it out if if uh, if we're actually yeah. There you that. go. There you go. <laughs> and we are back. All right, man. That was fun. I appreciate that. No problem. But yeah. you know what? One thing I forgot to mention that hopefully you mentioned on your on your platform, um, the census. Make sure um, you fill out the your your census form. You know, um, and make sure that you account it so the resources come to your community. So the census is important. You know, so 2020, make sure you complete the census. Definitely. We'll definitely do that. Uh, I appreciate you coming on today. You be safe out there and uh, 
in uh, Georgia. You wash your hands, wear your mask, uh, stay at home as much as you can, and uh, uh, we'll talk soon, okay? Yes, sir, man. Appreciate it. All right, brother. You take care. All right. All right, y'all. That's it for this episode of the Black and Blue Podcast. I want to thank my guests on this episode, Special Agent in Charge Rafiq Ahmad, for joining me here today. Man, you are a true inspiration, and I'm motivated more than ever to keep riding this black and blue train wherever it takes me. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. And if you guys out there want to continue on this journey with me, hey, the black and blue train is accepting passengers all the time, so make sure you like and subscribe to the show on the Black and Blue Podcast YouTube channel or whatever podcast platform you hear me today. I'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode with another entertaining guest, but till then, y'all know what to do. Stay black and blue. I'll holla at you. Peace. This has been a Major D Entertainment presentation.